uh, he's got his PhD at Queen's University in Kingston up in Canada, and then a uh, postdoc at the University of Ottawa for three years. And then he finally realized it was too cold up there. <laughs> and I'm sure he appreciates that right now. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and went, uh, uh, got a second postdoc at the um, University of Miami. Got involved in the NERDA research that we all know and love. And um, then finally got a faculty position at University of Texas where he's at the Port Aransas lab down on the coast. If you have never been to this lab, it's a pretty neat place. It's a really nice, nice marine lab. Um, his talk today, the ecophysiological consequences of acute oil exposure in marine fish. The, the title of my slide is actually the same one I submitted to the yeah. That's That never, never happened. happened. Um, all right, well, first I'd like to thank uh, everyone for showing up and really thank uh, whoever invited me because it's been a really, really nice uh, visit. Um, it was really nice to see a lot of the, the overlap between the department here and what we have going on at UTMSI, um, so um, thanks everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about just one aspect of my research program, but just to kind of give, start, start off, I want to give you a broader uh, kind of vision of what my, my lab does. Um, for the most part, I'm a, I consider myself an environmental physiologist. Uh, most of my work is focused on fish, but I've worked on a number of different organisms. Um, and what really drew me to the Gulf of Mexico is a couple of different things. Well, one is the, the ease at which I can get a whole bunch of really interesting species and species that are really, really hard to work on in a lot of places. Um, you guys probably have a good appreciation for this um, here, but like, for example, this is the red drum. This is one of my models. Um, the ability to hold, um, grow, and hold large numbers of these animals and change and manipulate experimental conditions is something that we can do at UTMSI. And this isn't something that a lot of marine labs or, or especially labs that aren't on the coast can offer. So that's one of the things that my lab does a lot of. We do a lot of environmental manipulations um, with the idea of looking at how animals respond to those environmental manipulations and how those environmental manipulations might impair an animal's performance. Um, so we do look a lot of work on different, different taxa. Uh, for example, we have the red drum. We do a lot of work on sharks. Uh, more recently, we've started working on the Atlantic tarpon. Um, and of course, we do a whole bunch of different types of environmental scenarios. And, and part of the reason why I was really interested in the Gulf of Mexico is because in some sense, the Gulf of Mexico is a, is a bit of a mess because there's a whole lot of different environmental challenges here. So for example, we have, as you well know, these seasonal hypoxia zones in the northern Gulf. Um, this is something that's becoming a problem um, worldwide. There's expanding deoxygenation of the world's oceans. It's really becoming a more of a hot topic. And this is something that my lab does a lot of, working in terms of, of the realm of phenotypic plasticity. Similarly, we're very interested in um, hypersalinity, which is a problem that's actually more unique to the Texas coast. Um, Port Aransas is home to one of the uh, largest barrier islands in the world, actually the longest barrier island in the world. And this means that the estuary in this area is a reverse estuary that can actually get upwards of 70 parts per thousand uh, salinity in the summer. So for an environmental physiologist who's interested in fish, Trying to understand the consequences of this extreme hypersalinity on fish performance is something that, that, that we do a lot of. We also do a lot of work in the realm of, of climate change, uh, both with respect to temperature and ocean acidification. And the reason I have the dollar sign there isn't just because there's a lot of research funding in that area, but it's also because the Gulf of Mexico is actually a, a, a thriving fisheries type of economy. Um, this comes from both the commercial aspects, but also recreational fisheries. Um, Port Aransas is a community that is really built around recreational fishing, even when it comes to the property values. People buy houses in this area because there's trophy fish for them to go capture. So when we're thinking about the impacts of, of climate change and ocean acidification, at least in the area that, that I do a lot of my research, this is real tangible economic value to, to stakeholders in the area. But today I'm going to be talking about um, an area um, that you are all pretty familiar with, I'm sure, um, kind of the ultimate impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. 
Um, this is something that I got into pretty much immediately after the oil spill during the, the NERDA work. Um, and so it's really taken on a life of its own since that time. Um, and it's turned into something that, you know, at first I was doing it because of an opportunity, and it's really evolved into something that is that that's probably going to be a big part of my research going forward. So I don't need to reiterate this slide to this audience, um, but there's one thing I do want to point out here. Um, just to reiterate one thing, and that is the extensive use of Corexit that was used after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. This is something that um, was kind of unique about the Deepwater Horizon. Um, also mixed with that is the, the depth at which the oil spill happened. These two things combined made the Deepwater Horizon oil spill somewhat unique from a chemical perspective. This is something that I am, I am aware of, and we've done a lot of research actually on potential impacts of Corexit. But I'm not going to talk about that today. But I want you to feel free to ask me about these types of questions um, at the end of the seminar. If, you're, if you are curious about some of these, these things that are going on with Corexit or maybe some of the work that we've done in this realm, feel free to open up um, or ask about that. The other thing that I want to reiterate is the idea about weathering. So you guys are probably all too familiar with images like this from the coast of Louisiana. Um, you have oil slicks that were out on the open water of the Gulf. Now, what's really important to remember about these types of, of images is that oil changes its chemical composition as a consequence of weathering. When oil was first released from the oil spill, it contained a whole slew of, of the toxic chemical, or constituents that really drive toxicity, which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, low molecular weight chemicals kind of are weathered off, and that leaves what's left, which is kind of a high molecular weight um, weathered oil slick. The differences in toxicity between these weathered and non-weathered oils are actually pretty apparent and pretty abundant. This is also something that we've done a lot of research on in the lab, but again, not something I'm going to talk about today. Feel free to ask me about it. So now that I've talked about all the things I'm not going to talk about, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the ecological, ecophysiological impacts on this species, um, the red drum. Red drum are really, really interesting, especially in the coast of Texas, um, because one, they're very, very abundant along the coast. They're an estuary dependent species. Uh, they spawn just offshore. Um, the fertilized embryos and larvae make their way through passes into the estuary where they settle. They usually stay in the estuary for about three years and then move back out offshore to, to join the spawning stock biomass. From an environmental perspective, they're actually pretty tolerant in many different environmental or too many different environmental conditions. Uh, they can, we've had them um, above 70 parts per thousand. Their critical oxygen threshold in terms of hypoxia is almost 20% or lower. They're very eurythermal, with about a 30 degree span in terms of uh, their, their thermal temperatures. And the last point is they're very economically important. At uh, the University of Texas Marine Science Institute, we're also lucky enough to have several uh, broodstock of these animals, which allows us to uh, spawn the animals and collect early life stages, which is so this embryo and this early life stage larva, which are very, very important for looking at toxicological impacts because often times the early life stages are the most sensitive. And this is kind of what we traditionally think of when we're talking about oil toxicity. So this kind of paradigm, which is considered to be the cardiotoxic paradigm, really was established back in the 80s following the Exxon Valdez oil spill. What you see, typically, is this is a control red drum larva, and this is an animal that's been exposed to probably about four micrograms per liter of, of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And what you see is a characteristic spinal curvature. You see malformed kind of uh, craniofacial uh, changes. And most importantly, you see this, which is a pericardial edema. This is a swelling of the cavity around the heart that is related to both um, 
improper development of the heart as well as improper functioning of the heart. Now, one of the first things that we did as a consequence of, of our work, and both with regard to uh, the GOAT Gomery funding as well as the NERDA, is to try and figure out what happens to these animals, not the ones that die, but the ones that actually survive that initial insult. So toxicology, toxicology is often kind of thought of as, you know, kill them and count them. But there's also this whole side, which is the sublethal impact. Animals can survive that initial insult, but are they actually going to live a long time and kind of join the spawning, uh, the spawning stop biomass? So one of the things we wanted to look at was the cardiac performance in these uh, early life stage fishes following oil exposure. And what you're looking at on this graph is just a measure of cardiac output measured from these larval fish. Essentially what we can do is we videotape the heartbeats, we measure the size of the heart chamber itself, and then we expose these animals to different levels of oil and see how that might change. And the, 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 the results were actually pretty startling. As you see, like a dramatic decrease in, in cardiac output with oil exposure. In fact, the, the EC50 of this, this effect was only at about two micrograms per liter. So that's two parts per million. Um, so in other words, there's, there's a pretty, pretty sensitive endpoint here in terms of cardiac impairment. But the more important thing in terms of, again, our, our interest is that this is, by definition, sublethal. The animal is still alive. Its heart is beating. It's not as effective at moving blood around its body, but it's still alive. So what are the ultimate implications of this reduced cardiac performance? And a lot of our interest in this area really comes from, from this. This is something called the aerobic scope theory or metabolic scope theory. And it, it kind of goes back to the idea that an animal has a minimum cost of living, but it also has a maximum constraint in terms of how much oxygen it can take in. So this is uh, often put in, in the context of different environments. And in this example for, is, is what happens as a consequence of temperature. What you're looking at here on the y-axis is just a metabolic rate. Along the x here is just a running from a cold temperature to a warm temperature. This green line represents standard metabolic rate. Standard metabolic rate is the baseline amount of energy that it takes to just stay alive. So consider yourself when you're lying in bed doing absolutely nothing, the energy that you're burning just doing that, that's standard metabolic rate. Now, it's pretty well determined in terms of temperature. Standard metabolic rate goes up as an animal gets warmer. It goes lower when an animal's colder. Now, the other side of the equation is this. This red line is the maximum metabolic rate. Maximum metabolic rate is a physiological value that defines how much oxygen an animal can take up. It's an absolute constraint. It's the maximum, no matter what, that an animal can, can use. So in other words, this is how much energy is available to the animal. Now, maximum metabolic rate can be constrained by a number of different environmental factors. And again, this is just an example of an idealized um, fish where maximum metabolic rate, there we go. Maximum metabolic rate has a peak and then it starts to collapse. Now, when it comes to oil exposure, the reason we are interested in aerobic scope theory is because maximum metabolic rate is defined by cardiac performance. The more blood an animal can pump around the body, the higher its maximum metabolic rate is going to be. Now the flip side of that, of course, is that any reduction in metabolic rate, or sorry, in, in cardiac performance, should constrain metabolic rate and therefore reduce this value here, which is aerobic scope. That is the difference between the cost of living and how much energy is available to the animal. Now, aerobic scope is really kind of become this catch-all metric in the field of ecophysiology and even ecotoxicology where 
people have done a lot of work specifically tying the magnitude of aerobic scope to different sorts of performance measures. So for example, you have a greater aerobic scope, you're going to have a greater capacity for exercise and activity. If you have a greater capacity for exercise and activity, you're probably going to be better off in terms of social competitions. You're going to be better at avoiding predators and capturing prey. You're going to have ultimately more success with reproduction. And then, of course, how aerobic scope responds to environmental stressors is going to determine your hypoxia tolerance and your thermal tolerance. Now, hypoxia tolerance I'll get into a little bit more later on, but this is just an example. What would happen if oil impaired aerobic scope? And what you're seeing here is any sort of drop in this parameter caused by toxins such as oil is going to have the potential to impact any and all of these ecological endpoints. And this kind of leads to a concept that um, you know, some of the older literature talks about in terms of ecological death. This is the idea that an animal can survive an environmental insult but the damage of that insult means it's not going to ultimately reproduce. If an animal doesn't ultimately reproduce, how much value does it actually have to the population? So that kind of gets into our overarching hypothesis of the work. This is something that we've been doing as part of the Recover Consortium funded by Gomery. Um, we've been going for about four or five years now. Um, now, our lab has specifically been exploring this question, which is, will acute oil exposure reduce oxygen transport capacity and thereby inhibit ecological performance? And we actually answered or explored this question with respect to a ton of different ecologically relevant variables. Now, I mentioned I'm not going to get into the weathering, but for the most part, just to kind of point out the type of oil we are using, for the most part, we are using naturally weathered oil for these experiments. Um, we use a pretty standard procedure called a, a high energy water accommodated, water accommodated fraction method that I'm sure many of you might be familiar with. Um, very briefly, we take some oil. This is weathered oil, really, it looks like clay. Put it in a blender. This is the ultimate solution. You let that settle out so that the oil globules kind of float to the top. You filter off the bottom 75% through this separation funnel, and that is your water accommodated fraction that you use to ultimately set up your exposure concentrations. We then are able to look at the specific chemistry of all of, of the compounds. Specifically, we look at the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And just as an example tracing, a weathered oil like this usually is pretty rich in these three ring polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, just for a point of reference, a source oil or a non-weathered would probably be very enriched with these two rings. Now the reason why we like to look at these chemistry uh, profiles is because the three ring pHs are largely thought to be the thing that is driving cardiac toxicity. So the very first thing we wanted to do when we were um, working on Red Drum is start validating some of these cardiac effects uh, to later life stage exposures. We do that through um, something called swim tunnel respirometry. And this is an example of that. So what you're looking at is essentially a treadmill for fish. Here's our motor. Water is getting spun around and through this laminar flow um, block. The fish is then able to you know, um, swim, and we're able to increase the swim speed to induce exercise. You'll notice the O-ring around the whole chamber, which means this is oxygen tight. We have an oxygen probe in there. We're able to measure oxygen consumption. And my lab is fortunate enough right now to have eight different uh, swim tunnels in the lab. So we're able to do this on a number of different light stages um, in relatively high throughput now. So how do these studies work? Well, this is an example um, of a, the, the kind of the data that you get out of a, a swim respirometry um, experiment. Along the x-axis here, you have the swim speed. We, we uh, listed in body lengths per second and normalized for size. Along the y-axis is the oxygen consumption. 
And what you can see is that as the animal swims faster and faster, the oxygen consumption goes up in a nice, defined uh, trace. When the animal fails at the end, that is considered to be the critical swim speed. This is the maximum swim uh, capacity of the animal. At that point, that is considered the maximum metabolic rate. So it's important to note that this swim trial, and that is a failed fish, um, the, the maximum metabolic rate for this protocol is specifically tar targeting aerobic swim performance. So in other words, the slow, smooth swimming, as you can see here. They're not really jumping around a lot. They're just kind of swimming at a nice, steady speed. Now we can use this relationship to track back to zero. And that is an estimate of standard metabolic rate, or the minimum cost of living. Again, the difference between those two things is our aerobic scope. So the first thing we really wanted to do is one, validate that the impacts that have been uh, described in other fish were true also for red drum. But more importantly, we wanted to assess how long lasting those effects were. Now this is important from an ecological standpoint because if an acute exposure causes an injury and that injury is recovered from within 48 hours, the scope for damage really isn't, isn't very great. So what we looked at, again, these on the, the left side of these graphs are our metabolic parameters. We have standard metabolic rate, maximum metabolic rate, and aerobic scope. These are all listed in terms of, of relative uh, drop. So the white bars represent a 4.1 microgram per liter uh, dose, and the, the other bars are all a 12.1 microgram per liter dose. And what you can see, after our 24-hour exposure, our maximum metabolic rate went down by about 15%, just as expected. The other points are after one week of recovery, which is the darker gray bar, and six weeks of recovery, which is the black bar. This is what was really interesting about this work. 24 hours of exposure to one oil dose resulted in impaired metabolic performance even a month and a half after that exposure. So these aren't effects that are just happening for a short amount of time. They're effects that are actually staying with the animal for a relatively long amount of time. They also manifest in swim speed. This is our critical uh, swim speed here. And this is uh, another swim measure called U-burst. This is when an animal transitions from aerobic swimming to burst swimming or anaerobic swimming. It's just a different type of measure. But again, we're seeing as expected, the, the significant drops in, in swim performance. And those as well do not recover. So in other words, we're seeing long-lasting injury. That's a really important first step. So then we started looking at indices of, of ecological performance. So for example, um, this is an undergrad in my lab who ran a, a study as part of her undergraduate thesis on predator prey dynamics. And specifically, she was looking at whether or not these oil-exposed uh, fish were going to be worse off in terms of capturing food. And as you would expect, what we're seeing here is a nice dose response in terms of the total number of, of food items total that an animal was able to catch in a defined amount of time, as well as a nice dose response uh, increase in the time to capture, both defined as first capture and time to fifth capture. This is out of a total of 10 potential captures. Uh, I want to point out here that these oil doses might seem a little bit higher than the last group, but these are actually, because of our exposure regimen, these are defined based on only the concentration at the beginning, whereas the last doses were a combination or the geometric mean of the initial versus the final part of the exposure. So in fact, these, these exposures are really quite in line. We then started looking at kind of some more interesting aspects of, of ecological performance, um, namely social competition. So the social competition aspects, oh, the video stuff. So the social competition aspects that we're really interested in are, are direct uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one competition. So 
This is something that people don't fully appreciate all the time, but fish are jerks. And they don't really like each other when they have to compete for resources. And we design these types of tests. Um, they're called the dyad tests. And essentially what happens is we put two animals in a common tank, and we allow them to acclimate to that tank for about 24, 48 hours. And then we start feeding them at one specific time point. And so they get into this situation where they start competing with each other for what would be the lone structure in the, in the tank, as well as competing with each other for the food as it's introduced into the tank. And we'll often get one animal that becomes dominant and one animal that becomes subordinate. And the dominance is defined based on a, a number of different traits. So one of those traits is this, is this video, which is the prevalence of one animal to attack the other. And again, they just, they beat each other up pretty good. Over a course of a week, they can, like we've had to actually stop um, tests early because of, of too much social interaction. Like how uh, that's phrased, yeah. <laughs> um, so now we, we don't just look at those attacks, we look at a whole bunch of different measures. It could be where they are in the tank, how well they are uh, at, at successfully getting the food, um, the proclivity to, from one fish to avoid the other fish. And we kind of combine all of these data using a principal component analysis into something we call a behavior score. And with this type of a, an analysis, we always see this breakdown where one animal in the tank has a positive score and another has a negative score, and that is how we use uh, or define a dominant versus a subordinate individual. Um, so what you're seeing here is just evidence that yes, we successfully were able to define social hierarchies in all of our tests. Now, what's really interesting, and this is the background information that my PhD student Alexis Hersigara collected, is that aerobic scope is a predictor of dominance. So in other words, when she did a, a series of, of analyses, the animal with the higher aerobic scope always, almost always, I actually think it is always, but almost always um, had the dominant or became the dominant individual in these competitions. If you have more aerobic scope, you will be able to perform better. Now the reason why that was so interesting is because based on our last set of data, oil exposure reduces aerobic scope. And the other point is that oil exposure or that reduction of aerobic scope can last for up to six weeks, possibly more. So in other words, for highly mobile animals, um, following a, a heterogeneous spill event, there is a very, very real possibility that an exposed animal is going to have to compete with an unexposed animal or uh, you know, another type of un unexposed individual for resources in the common environment. And so the idea being, does oil exposure kind of define an animal or, or put them at a, at a competitive disadvantage? And when we actually did that test, again, using these dyad measures, this time one animal was exposed to, to oil and one was not. Again, behavior score uh, graph just demonstrating that we had successful social hierarchy formation. And what we found is Again, in about 90% of cases, an animal that was exposed to oil was going to be the subordinate individual. So oil exposure predisposes animals to social subordination. So the question then became, okay, if an animal is um, predisposed to social subordination, how does that actually impact individuals in these complex groups that happen in nature. And so Alexis came up with a really cool uh, experimental design where we, we took a bunch of, of animals, about 15 animals, they were all individually pit tagged so that we could track their growth over time. We exposed all the animals to one of three treatments, either a high dose uh, oil, a low dose oil, or no dose uh, control. Um, all of those exposures were again 24 hours. And then we put them in these common rearing tanks for two months. And every two weeks, we sampled all the individuals for their weights, and we were, because they were pit tagged, we were able to individually track their growth rates. So what we found at first was a little surprising. Uh, 
what you can see is no matter what time point we were looking at, the oil exposed and the control animals uh, grew at pretty much the exact same rate. This is specific specific growth rate. That's a measure of essentially how much an animal is growing each day. So this was a little confusing to us and disheartening for Alexis because you know an animal has reduced swimming performance, reduced metabolic performance. They can't seem to capture prey. They're more likely to be subordinate, but all of that really doesn't matter when you put them in these groups. So we were thinking about it. Um, you know, why is that? Why is that? And then we started to realize, you know, when we're growing animals in the lab, we typically are trained to just provide them with food. Provide them with as much food as, as they can eat or how much they want. In other words, we maximize their growth rate. You know, an animal that has unlimited access to food can keep itself out of a lot of trouble. So we decided to run this whole thing again with a reduced feeding ration. So in this case, we fed animals only 1% of their body weight per day. The previous experiment was controlled at about 3% body weight per day, which is near saturation for, the, for that stage of, of growth. And this time, what we saw is that, yes, the oil-exposed animals, here, this group, and this group, over time, they started to manifest in terms of having a reduced specific growth rate relative to the controls. So in other words, the environment that you are testing your animals, animals in really does matter. If, a, if an animal is in a resource-rich environment that has no predators, something that is considered a sublethal exposure probably isn't going to have too much in terms of dramatic effects. Because the animal can you know, just keep itself out of trouble. Alternatively, if an animal is in a patchy resource environment where they actually have to compete to get food, and they might have to give a key to avoid predators, they're less likely to, to succeed if they've been exposed to, to oil. We then wanted to turn our attention to some of these additive stressors that might be happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, particularly, we were interested in hypoxia because um, the northern Gulf of Mexico, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is, a, is a relatively common area for these, these uh, hypoxic zones. Um, now, in terms of hypoxia tolerance, uh, people, people typically define hypoxia tolerance in any number of ways. But for the purpose of respiratory physiology, hypoxia tolerance can be best described as by this measure here, which is the critical oxygen threshold. This is the lowest oxygen pressure that an animal can still maintain their standard metabolic rate. So if you're looking at this graph, the x-axis is the ambient oxygen, with zero being over here and full saturation over here. And the y-axis, again, is oxygen consumption. And it's assumed that this, this blue line is a typical fish. As an animal is exposed to lower and lower oxygen, maximum metabolic rate is going to be constrained until it crosses with standard metabolic rate. This is the point that an animal can no longer maintain standard metabolic rate through aerobic metabolism. They have to start using anaerobic metabolism. Now, if we were to assume that the oil exposure, or sorry, the drop in maximum metabolic rate that comes from oil exposure is maintained throughout the entire aerobic scope curve, you would assume that the critical oxygen threshold would be pushed to the right. What that means is that an animal would have to rely on unsustainable anaerobic metabolism at a higher environmental oxygen tension if it had been exposed to oil. And in terms of these, these experiments, we use a slightly different technique than the swimming respirometry. We use just standard instrument flow respirometry. Uh, this is where you put an animal in a chamber at rest, and you just let it stay there for 24 hours, having the water exchanged like every three minutes and monitoring uh, oxygen consumption. So when we did these experiments, we actually found, um, we, were, we were actually quite surprised, and we found that oil exposure did not compromise uh, hypoxia tolerance. So in other words, we actually do find that oil doesn't always mess with. Um, what we're seeing here 
This is all a pair of experimental design. So we measure each animal twice. You have an initial measurement and a final measurement. Typically, you'll see this increase in, in PCRIT um, depending on, on how accustomed an animal starts to get with the protocol, depending also on how much growth happened between the two, the two time points. All of those things were controlled in this experiment. But what you're seeing here is that there's no significant difference between the, the, the initial and final measurements in critical oxygen threshold in the controls versus when you expose these animals to, to oil. And I should also point out that while the data is not shown here, we did see the significantly reduced aerobic scope at these exact same oil doses. So in other words, what we hypothesized is that as the animal uh, moves into hypoxic environments, cardiac physiology becomes less important for the animal in terms of constraining uh, metabolic rate. We think that at lower oxygen levels, the system becomes more based around affinity, or in other words, hemoglobin oxygen binding capacity, the ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen. And that isn't something that we believe is impaired by it, although it is something that we're starting to test now. Now, that is all based on, on the cardiac toxicity paradigm. Now, one of the things that really started to stick out to us during a lot of this work, especially when Alexis started in on her behavior, or sorry, the, you know, the dominant style work, is that there's, there's a, a bunch of data now that's coming out about an emerging kind of paradigm that we're, we're calling a behavioral impairment. And it really started here. This is a, just an IPA analysis of, a, of transcriptome. Uh, from larval fish, um, again, exposed animals versus, uh, versus control red drum. And what we're seeing relatively consistently across studies, even across different species, is that the transcriptomic profile suggests some degree of neural impairment. So what you're seeing here with this series of data is that the transcriptomic profile is indicative of a reduced quantity of brain tissue in these individuals. Similarly, what you're seeing here is that there's some indication that the long-term um, depression of synapses, which is really important for um, basic motor function, basic learning, some of these types of things, is also impaired. So in other words, there's this kind of transcriptomic evidence that, that their cognitive function might be disrupted. <laughs> And in fact, we were starting to see that same thing in some of our other assays. So this is a, an open field uh, activity test. This is something that we set up to actually look at, at swimming, routine swim performance, just how much an animal moves around. Um, you can't really see them very well, but that's a, a larval red drum. Now, we didn't actually see any difference in, in the amount of, of swim distance that the animal, you know, exhibited during between controls and, and oil exposed. But what we did see is this concept of thigmotaxis. So thigmotaxis is the premise that an animal will stay near a wall of an arena. It's considered a measure of anxiety. If an animal is anxious like, and afraid of predators, they're gonna stay near this wall. Animals that move into the center of the arena uh, are considered bold. They're essentially putting themselves at risk. And what we saw during these types of tests is that animals that were exposed to oil showed a proclivity to use the center of the arena. The other thing we noticed is that the animals exposed to oil were more likely to use and explore the entire arena based on this, on this graph here. You see, at our highest oil dose, they explored almost 80% of the arena by area. So this is some sort of indication that the animals were becoming more bold and less anxious. Now that's important because of its anti-predator consequences, and I'll get into that in a moment. Now when I started seeing this with our, our initial um, study, I contacted a friend of mine who at the University of Glasgow who actually is a, um, a hardcore behavioral researcher, and we came up with this design on looking at shoaling behavior. So in this study design, we tagged individual fish with these um, nice colored beads. We bedazzled them. 
Um, this is us just sewing the beads onto the fish. <laughs> Literally, we just sewed. <laughs> so what you're looking at is essentially a video of animals that can be either in an entire control group, an entire oil group, or a mixed group. In other words, an individual is exposed to oil and the other is not. And what we found is that at our higher oil doses, the distance of animals between each other started to get in, to, to increase. In other words, the shoaling behavior of the animals started to deteriorate. Again, this is one of those things that is an anti-predator type, type of behavior. Shoaling has a lot of benefits in avoiding predation, and it also has benefits for, for finding food. And so we actually started seeing these same types of, of results in a number of different um, uh, experimental designs. And we actually started talking to our colleagues who were also starting to see some of these types of things. And now we're starting to explore this type of a, of a hypothesis, which is that oil exposure drives animals from a reactive type of personality to a proactive type of personality. So what does that mean? Well, animals typically you know, there's a whole lot of behavioral research about animal personality. The idea that animals will repeatedly show certain types of behaviors that can be characterized based on personality axes. So for a reactive fish, they essentially prioritize um, risk over reward. They're afraid of predation. They're not going to swim out into the open, even if they know there's food out there, because they're too afraid of predators. These animals are typically social animals, anxious animals. They have reduced activity. They don't explore as much, and they're typically not as aggressive. On the flip side is an animal that prioritizes reward over risk. This is an animal that will take chances to get food. These are antisocial animals. They essentially don't care about other fish. They do their own thing. They also goes along with boldness, activity, exploration and aggressiveness. Now I want to point out that there's no value judgment in these, in these strategies. These are two different strategies to success. There's a lot of benefits to not being eaten. There's also benefits to being proactive and going out and seeking reward, especially if there isn't actually a predator there. But what we are starting to see is that oil exposure drives animals from reactive to proactive. And that can have actually important consequences to, to anti-predator behavior, or at least to theorize it would. And to actually test that hypothesis, we designed um, kind of a settlement and anti-predator type of assay. And we actually did this on a, on a couple of different fish. Um, this is some work that we did down at Lizard Island in Australia. Um, and this is our red drum that we did in Puerto Aransas. Um, the Lizard Island stuff was done first, kind of our, as our test design, because it's a really nice structured group, uh, but I'm going to present them side by side here. Essentially, the first part of the assay related to whether or not animals exposed to control or oil would recruit to these different types of habitats commonly found in their, their, their environment um, under normal types of scenarios, with the idea that it's beneficial for the animals, the larval fish, to recruit to these structures because it carries an anti-predator benefit. And in fact, what we found was that as animals, or at least for our coral reef fish, when they were exposed to oil, they started showing a decrease in proper recruitment and settlement behavior. They were more likely to be found over just the sandy bottom of the tank and less likely to be found on the highly complex coral structures that we added to the tank. Conversely, our red drum larvae really didn't show any effects with oil. Um, we believe that this is probably a, a difference in their just general behaviors because coral reef fish larvae are actually really, really, or show really, really high site fidelity. They recruit to a coral and they don't leave that coral. They're good until they grow up. Our red drum larvae are swimming around the tank like that. So there's very little interest in, in site fidelity for egg drum. We then wanted to look at whether or not there was any sort of impact on <coughs> avoiding predators. So at this point, we introduced a common larval predator for each species. Uh, it was a snapper for, for the coral reef, uh, 
and it was a pinfish for the red drum. And we looked at um, the rates of predation. As we would expect based on, on the settlement behavior, our coral reef larva fish showed increased predation rates after they had been exposed to oil, a uh, significant reduction in survival by about 20%. Now, we were able to do the statistics in a slightly different way for the red drum because we typically saw full mortality in the course of our, our assays. Uh, pinfish are really voracious larval predators. And so what we saw here is a nice, uh, is essentially on the x is the time of, of the assay, and on the, on the y axis is the mean percentage that are still alive. And you see this nice reduction over time. But the most important thing is to look at is right here. That is the estimated time to 50% mortality along with the, the confidence interval. And what you see is there's a significant reduction in the time to 50% mortality when an animal has been exposed to oil. It, it goes down by about 30%. So why is that? <laughs> is it because of behavior or is it because of reduced swim performance? So we went back to our, our swim tunnel respirometry. And we looked at whether or not larval fish swim performance was impaired at the dose of oil that we saw these kind of predation effects. Again, on the left is our metabolic parameters, standard metabolic rate, maximum metabolic rate, and aerobic scope. On the right is our swimming performance. This is in, in body lengths per second. And what you see, the blue bar is essentially the equivalent to where we saw the predation effects. And there is no impact on any of our metabolic parameters. There's also no impact on our swim performance parameters. We did eventually start seeing impairment in swim performance at a much higher dose. And this is actually a little bit of an overestimate. If there was one replicate that had higher, it doesn't matter. But, um, the most important thing is it doesn't line up with our predation data. So what this kind of means, at least how we're interpreting it, is that we don't think it's cardiac performance or impaired cardiac performance that's resulting in this reduced um, ability to avoid predators. We believe that it's probably related to behavioral impairment or behavioral changes. Larval fish starting to take more risks um, that lead to predation. And that's something that we're, we're continuing to explore. Right now we're starting to look at fish learning, um, how oil exposure is, is potentially um, impairing various types of cognitive functions. Okay, and with that, I will, I'll just sum up. Um, so what we know, oil does cause cardiorespiratory impairment. And this cardiorespiratory impairment is coincident with reduced exercise performance. We also know that this reduced exercise performance has all the expected subsequent effects. Um, this means we see reduced prey capture, we see increased incidence of social subordination. Uh, surprisingly, it does not result in any decreases in hypoxia tolerance, at least as defined by respiratory physiology. You are the only participant. <laughs> cool. Um, now, there is an emerging idea that oil exposure is impacting behavioral um, or animal behavior, uh, essentially through behavioral syndromes um, that might be reducing anti predator behavior. And we think this is resulting in overall reductions in um, the ability to, to avoid predators in a predation assay. And with that, just thank uh, our research funding from Gulf Mexico, and these are all the, the people who actually do the work while I sit my ass. Questions? Yeah, yeah you were first. So, um, in a, uh, I've read a few papers, I'm not really a big physiologist, but this whole uh, bold versus more timid behavior. Yep. It, it, that switch can occur with other sort of, um, you know, increased pH or decreased pH, like, um, you know, low oxygen. And even with predators that are like um, lay and wait predators, they will start to look around more. And so even predators are being able to, they catch less prey because they're moving more than they should. Yes. So like, what if this is adaptive and 
whenever there's this big area full of toxins, it's just better to be bold and try to move around more, you know, in the long term than sitting there and dying. I, yes, 100%. You know, there's, there's intuitively like a value judgment we kind of put on things and it's really important for us to think about what the animal is trying to do. Like it's very possible that they are sensing the, the fact that they have reduced aerobic capacity or that there's some sort of injury and their stress axis has gone up and they're just trying to get out. And I think one of the things that um, hopefully we'll be able to answer with future studies, like especially things like learning, um, you know, that we might be able to look into, into that type of stuff. Um, now, there is some data from, from human uh, literature uh, based on pyrogenic pHs, so not the oil spill stuff, but things like benzoylpyrene that are also driving potentially um, increased incidences of anxiety. Um, so anxiety is a very defined thing that you can, you can assess by drugs. Like you, if you hit it with gabapentin, an ang uh, anxi anxiogenic drug, you should get a defined response. And we get that in fish. It's just trying to interpret the intention of the animal. So yes, 100%. Cool. Yeah. So along those lines, does that oil-induced subordinate relationship, is that dose responsive? If you increase the dose, they become more subordinate? Or? It's a binomial measure. So we did do it. We saw increased or we saw um, maintained effects. So, so essentially we did a chi-squared and then the proportion of animals that essentially you have a 85% likelihood of being subordinate if you've been exposed regardless of dose. Um, so what happens 50. if you do that that test with a fish as opposed to 10 micrograms per liter oil versus one as opposed to 50? Now that's a good question. Uh, you know, the assumption is that the the if it's tied to aerobic performance, that the degree of injury should matter. But you know, you also start to get into complex experimental designs there. But yeah, you're right. I think it would be interesting to hit them with a a really high dose versus a moderate dose and see if it because that could carry ecological significance there too. Yes. Could you elaborate a little on <clears throat> what you think uh, might be the connection between the neural type impairment that you were referring to and what you think might, how that might translate into some of the behavioral um, reactions that you? Yeah, it's tough at this point. Um, like we're, we're seeing differences in terms of overall like indicators transcriptomically and anatomically in terms of developmental exposure where their brains are smaller. Um, we're also seeing um, synaptic synaptic measures that are that are altered in terms of reduced. Now tying that to any specific behavior is tough. Um, we want to start looking at um, things like the NMDA receptor, GABA receptors, some of those neuroendocrine types of measures, and mm -hmm. see. But that's the type of work that we're we're planning for this is, year. Is uh, Peter Thomas still where, where you? Yeah. At? Yeah. That he might be. He yeah, he, 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 with an yeah, when I told him we weren't doing reproductive hormones, he was just like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, he's, he's definitely a great resource. Yeah. Yes? So it's really pretty counterintuitive that you didn't see a difference in hypoxia tolerance following exposure. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what was the what was the, the life stage for those experiments? Those were all... Um, uh, Sub adults, so they're, they're juvenile and they were fish. But as juveniles? They were so that the testing was done. Um, when did we do that? Twenty four. We gave them twenty four hours between the oil exposure to relax to come out of it before they went back in the respirometer. Yeah, yeah so it was almost what immediate. I'm thinking is if you were exposed as a larval fish during that critical cardiac development window, knowing what we know about the morphological defect affiliated with that timing of, of that. Um, I, Absolutely. Now, there's one of the things that kind of gets glossed over, and I'm guilty because I just glossed over it, but um, there's a difference in how the cardiac impairments manifest in development versus in later life, right? So in development, the heart is, it's shaped differently, you know, so it has reduced cardiac output. Um, in later life, it also has a reduced cardiac output, but the, the actual channels that control the heartbeat are disrupted. Um, they manifest the kind of the same way from in terms of cardiorespiratory physiology though. So they both have a reduction in cardiac output, which correlates to a reduction in maximum metabolic rate. And so the thing that I think is happening, and we're testing this hypothesis now, is that what defines critical oxygen threshold isn't cardiac performance. We think it's the, 
the, the hemoglobin. And so there is a lot of data out there that has correlated um, the P50 of hemoglobin, which is the oxygen saturation at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated itself. That that is a better measure of, or um, predictor of critical oxygen threshold than total cardiac performance. Um, in fact, it's a little bit counterintuitive in terms of how the, a fish heart reacts to hypoxia. Um, their heart rate slows down. So they, in a lot of animals, when you're reduced or exposed to um, an oxygen stress, your heart rate will go up because you want more blood through your lungs uh, for fish, more blood through the, th through the gills. They do the opposite. They actually try and shut the system down a little bit, increase the stroke volume to maintain cardiac output. Red Drum, and we've done these studies um, with a collaborator, Dane Crossley, at the uh, University of North Texas, they actually shut down the whole thing. So under control conditions, they reduce their cardiac output. So we actually think that cardiac output matters for exercise, but when an animal's not exercising, like critical oxygen threshold, it becomes less important. Yeah. yeah. Could the, the, the brain impairment that you're talking about could that, um, relate to the idea of, um, I guess, aggressive behavior to try to overcome issues? Mm -hmm. Is it is it possible that there could be some issue with um, because of the brain impairment, like lack of awareness, or more confusion in terms of how they're foraging versus the idea of aggressive behavior? Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, a lot of that can be interpretation. Um, we. Uh, another one of our, our collaborators after after this stuff started to kind of show its head, he started working with fighting fish. <laughs> Good one to test the aggression. And he saw an increase, significant increase in, in aggressive behavior following oil exposure against a mirror. So it takes kind of the foraging aspect out of it a little bit. Um, it's a different model, but yes. I think it's gonna be really hard, I think, especially for the animal personality stuff to to distinguish proper impairment on a neurological level with some sort of escape response or some sort of just, you know, a drunk fish kind of thing, you know, like, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to do that. We're gonna start trying to do more trans focused transcriptomics just on the brain. We're gonna look at um, measures of apoptosis as well, like looking for brain damage indicators of that. Um, so there's a couple different things that we can kind of explore based on some other toxicants that are out there. It's tough. One yes. More, one more question. Oh, I'm just wondering about you know, <coughs> with these axes of behavioral axes that you described that are, that show that the dichotomy. If you look at a bunch of un unexposed fish and sort of separate them into two kind of groups in terms of their variation that they those groups represent, if you could categorize them as one or the other, then how do they compare to the oil fish? That's a great question, and we're doing that. So we've just designed a, a kind of like a high throughput style assay where we can go through all the axes of personality in one go. Um, it's like a, an hour, hour and a half test, do a few different things, get it all, put it on the principal component. Um, we're gonna first do like an unpaired design, but then we're gonna do a screen where we define the animals beforehand as proactive or reactive, expose them to oil, and then see if there's a shift. Because what's interesting about it is, if it's always driving animals to be more proactive, then it's really only affecting some of the animals on the spectrum. It's not gonna be impacting the bold animals. They're not gonna get more bold if they're already as bold as you can be. But, um, it's also possible that it's just messing with their brains and then they're, they might just show differences and shifts. So that's why we're gonna try the paired and the unpaired designs, add it with a couple of other kind of RNA signals to look at better damage. And then again, the learning, which is going after something in a different way. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Oh.